He took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. I'll keep my freedom. I'll keep my guns. Try to keep my money and my religion too. Now, now, keep in mind that some of my guests have been approached by oh, Homeland Security or FBI saying, Oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys that they're listening this morning is go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same oath, you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. I'm gonna keep my big BA. Keep my friends the same. Keep the government out of my business and y'all can keep the change. He is the free American, Clay Douglas. You know what we need? We know who to blame. Catch the Free American Hour, weekdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a new year of the Free American Hour. This will be pushing about 19 years or more on the air. I want to I want to bring up an old friend here in just a minute or two, but I want you to I want you to understand a few things about me. I've got. Uh, fairly high IQ and I have uh, been a writer most of my life I could read before I went to school and before I was 14 years old I read almost every science fiction book in the uh, Fort Worth Public Library I've gotten about a 90% comprehension. I read about a thousand words a minute, and I read the newspapers from all over the world every day for the last 25 years when I decided that what happened at Waco was more than a tragedy. It was a harbinger of what was to come. It was how the government was going to treat cults. And if you're not in the mainstream, if you're not in the Catholic Church, you're a cult. My latest book is called Mystery Babylon, and I wrote that as a guide to explain to you folks what Christian identity was, and because Christian identity by Homeland Security had been listed as a, ooh, uh, 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 something dangerous, like the militias. And folks, this is not some rumor that I started. This is not something I did to try to aggrandize myself or promote myself. I started the militias in New Mexico after what happened at Waco. We had meetings called Wake Up America meetings. I brought in people like Mark Kuenke. I brought in people like uh, uh, Charlie Duke from Colorado. And uh, we, we brought in people from Oklahoma City like Charles Key. And I started the Free American around that particular group and I started the militias and, and just people that came to the meeting because the militia is you every friggin one of you out there I don't care how old you are the US code says 18 to 45 I don't care so we went here here let me tell you how the militia was formed we arranged for about 15 or 20 of us from the Wake Up America meetings in Albuquerque to go to to uh, up to near Raton uh, to the NRA field up there and I hired a professional trainer to come in and instruct everybody there 
including my two teenage sons, how to use a weapon. How to use your weapon properly, how to clean, how to point it, how to, how, to, how to aim, how to fire. We were on a firing range. We taught them necessary skills, skills that they taught me in the Army. And a professional did. And by the way, my sons outshot everyone there. The next time we had a militia meeting was in Edgewood, New Mexico. I'll tell you about that in a second. They were trying to get organized. They were trying to get organized. So, so militias had, uh, had, had formed in a couple of different states, and somebody put together the idea of the tri-state militia, and we, uh, they, they held a meeting and I invited the press to come to Edgewood, New Mexico. I got there, and the organizer tried to kick me out. I started the militias in New Mexico. I wasn't the commander. I just started I advertised for it, and ADL gave me credit for that. They just didn't tell you that the militias met in the governor's office Again, they tried to kind of keep me out of that, but I was there. And the person that was organized the Tri-States Militia turned out to be a FBI informant being paid $1,776 a month to try to set the militias up for something. People used to ask me, Clay, well, <laughs> uh, uh, do you know a militia we could join? If you uh, join a militia and there's ten people in it and you haven't known all of them your whole life, one of them's a fed there to try to set you up. Maybe I was just paranoid back in 1994. Maybe. But then they blew up the BATF blew up Oklahoma City. Not, not a one of them was injured in the thing because none of them had been there. We just had, and I just had this story of Oklahoma City. I found here the a noble lie that linked in, and those shows are linked right now. It's up on TalkShoe. It's up on YouTube. You need to pass that around to everybody because that's what they did with that was to try to stop me. I was gaining too much power. I was gaining too much notoriety. They tried to kill me in 2004. Now, yeah, well, it could just been an accident. Yeah, yeah, maybe this woman that just uh, uh, borrowed a car and ran over me who had drug charges pending, who didn't have insurance, who didn't, and who never went to jail never showed up in court and they kept me unconscious for three friggin months folks that is not exactly uh, that's not exactly normal procedure for uh, a biker with three broken ribs now how I survived with a supposed head injury supposed uh, severe head injury and and whew, you know, maybe three broken ribs and a broken collar. I had a broken collarbone too, and I had a bump on the head. I had blood on the brain. Yep, maybe, maybe so, maybe so. But they kept me drugged for three months on Halcyon, Haldol, Valium, and other uh, antipsychotic drugs that do more damage than the drugs they sell. And I've done stories on that too. I've done stories on that. You can go back and see what they're doing to Mark Taylor right now, Donna Taylor's son, who was shot at Columbine. And I reported on all these people, and I was targeted. I was the first, one of the first 9-11 truthers. I had building number seven on the cover of my magazine, Free American Magazine. It was on the newsstands in uh, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, all across the country. I had national distribution.
And then I made the mistake of calling home and asking my son, where do you need me to go next, son? Where are you, Dad? North side of Phoenix, Sacred Skin Tattoo. Oh, go down 24th Street to McDowell, turn up to the wheel shop. It's right there, Dad. Okay, son. See you later. Now, this was exactly 30 days after the story broke in the New York Times about the NSA being allowed by George Bush to tap anybody's cell phones. I had an ATT cell phone that I had had for 10 years. I had one of the first cell phones in the country. The ADL spread my name around to millions of people in a publication called Armed and Dangerous. Southern Poverty Law did the same for me. In their false patriots, when I was working with a presidential candidate, I was in the same room, in the same conference rooms, in the same hotels, with Pat Buchanan, with Bob Dole, with Alan Keyes, and Charles Collins. I wrote some of, helped Charles write his speeches. Knowledgeable man, Rhodes Scholar, wonderful gentleman, still my friend. I met with people like Dr. Eugene Schroeder. I met with people like my friend Bill Cooper. Matter of fact, Bill and I got along so well. Alex didn't like either one of us. But he sure traded off our publicity because Alex spoke at my conferences. I put on conferences. I put on preparedness expos. I appear, uh, and I went to almost every preparedness expo. I've spoken at three key conventions because I actually got started in this years, years before, folks, when I was publishing a motorcycle magazine in Miami and discovered somebody handed me a document. If I'd had a security clearance, they probably would have arrested me, but it was public property by then. The, the, the first time I got visited by the CIA, we're going to let you live this time, Clay, but don't, uh, don't, uh, don't do anything like that again. I ran the story of Operation Watchtower. Operation Watchtower was a operation by special forces commanded by Colonel Edward P. Cotolo. They built radio guide towers down in Columbia and flew 100 planes into Albrook Air Force Base from Columbia. My buddy William Tyree was a part of that operation. He was included in Cotolo's documents because Cotolo arranged for him to go to prison because there was a security leak. His wife was writing a diary. His friends knew about it. Cotolo sent their guys in. They killed his wife and they framed him for the murder. They tapped the courtroom. I found the, uh, I, I, I found the news stories about the tapping equipment. That, and I wrote about that and put it in my biker magazine. And the FBI are the, uh, well, I, I, to tell you the truth, who knows? You know, one guy shows up, just another biker. Clay, we're going to let you live this time. Just don't do anything like that again. So I came out with Free American. I started doing this radio show. Now I'm doing a television show. But I'm not getting much, uh, I'm not, now, I was also listed by the FBI in their little booklet that they put out, put out to every police department around the country, and there's Clay Douglas, the free American, under the FBI's heading, a Guide to Right-Wing Extremist. I called up two people. One of them you're going to hear from in just a second. And that was Governor Gary Johnson, who I started the militias with, with his full knowledge. 
We worked for him. That's it. If we were ever needed. If we were ever needed. And if you listen to the show, you'll know that Timothy McVeigh was working for the Army. This was a, a setup to try to demonize people like me. This is supra government. This is, this is, uh, and, and, and believe me, because I've been through this whole thing. Hello, Donna. You called? I did. I was going to uh, uh, bring you up on my radio show. I'm just doing a. Uh, I'm doing a show. I'm do I don't have any guests today. I'm just trying to uh, do this to explain to people everything that's going on. And uh, I had. You know, Mark has caught in the court system to be on the drug. And the court appointed attorney. We've got to hire another attorney to go in and fire her. And then I have to get some medical attorney to get in there and get him off of that. I don't so, have the money to hire attorney. So they're still they're still keeping him drug. Now, folks, this yeah. is the, uh, now the person I'm talking to right at the moment is Donna Taylor. She's the mother of Mark Taylor. Mark was the first student shot at Columbine. He survived seven gunshot wounds, and went out, got a uh, recovered, wrote a book, and made the mistake of coming to Arizona to meet me. From that point on, uh, he was uh, uh, Donna. Uh, he 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 got sick. Uh, Donna took him to emergency room, and they kept him for a year. It took us a year to get attorneys together to to be able to get him out, to get him out, to get him out of this system in in Arizona, to get him back to Colorado, get him back with his family. And now, the courts have stepped in and put him back into the care of a pharmaceutical company uh, sponsored uh, 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 organization. Mark Taylor is one of the people that sued that sued the uh, drug companies for what they did to the shooters at Columbine and won and didn't get any money out of it, got screwed out of it by the lawyers, the Bar Association lawyers and Donna's been experiencing the same thing, her sons are back in uh, but but he's with you. You actually have no responsibility right at the moment because they put him back. The courts have put him back with his father, who's been absent for the last what ten years. Uh -huh. Did I did I get all that right, dear? Yep. Mark's in a group home now, but he's still a drug. They got him back on Clozapin too. Okay, this is the this is the crap they, they had him. They taking him off. I can't find out nothing. They won't talk to me. The doctor will not talk to me. Well, you're just his mother now. The father has a guardianship, right? Right. Well, dear, I will keep uh, people informed, and and uh, this is kind of what I do, folks. I I, I took a, I I basically told uh, my ex-wife uh, after what happened to Waco, I could not sit back and watch things like that happen again. And what's happening to Mark Taylor right now? They tried to do to me. They put him on some of the same drugs that they had me on, Halcyon or Hal. And and this is uh, this uh, my attorney told me, Clay, it's a, it's a miracle you're up and walking and talking. So. Yeah. I hope we need an attorney really bad, so anybody knows one that can help from Colorado, let me know. All right, and uh, folks, it's my, bad. you know, you know what, folks, I have, I, I, I stepped up to the plate to try to to do something about this. We've succeeded in in a small portion, but without the money to continue, without the support, without your support out there, folks, we can't get anywhere. We can't get anywhere, and, and you can give all the money you want to the lawyers, and, and they won't do as good a job as some of the people that I know. Right. I need somebody wants to go after them. Well, you know, that's a, that's a, that, that was uh, the gripe I had with your attorney, Wesley Hoyt. And Wesley Hoyt has failed to do anything for Edgar Steele, so... Uh, uh, again, yeah. here's here's our money going to somebody who refused to sue the pharmaceutical companies that took your son and kept him for a year here in Arizona. Got him again. All right, dear. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Now, folks, I, I took that call because that's kind of what I do. And you're sitting in my living room right now. I have been doing this 
for years since I got the Cotolo documents. And the Cotolo documents, I might add here, are contained in their entirety in my book, Mystery of Babylon. Large print edition, folks. Cost more. Cost more to print. No, Mark is in a group home in Colorado, outside of Denver. And and this is what they're trying to do. Oh, my God, you can save 10% if you take your kids into Safeway down here. You can save 10% on your food bill by getting a vaccination for your kid. It's not just Mark. It's not just me. It is all of us. If you rebel against the New World Order, if you don't want to, to uh, keep funding the murder of millions of brown-skinned people, then you, oh, you must be a radical. If you you know this is this this is the propaganda war that's going on right now as we talk, and there's people out there that you need to hear of, you need to hear from, because they're trying to tell you the truth, and I'm going to give you two of my friends, two of my friends, two people that I met personally. And Congressman Paul, you say that the federal government should stay out of people's personal habits. Uh, you say marijuana, cocaine, even heroin should be legal if states want to permit it. You feel the same about prostitution and gay marriage. Question, sir, why should social conservatives in South Carolina vote for you for president? Well, <laughs> They, they will if they understand my defense of liberty is the defense of their right to practice their religion and say their prayers where they want and practice their life. But if, if you do not protect liberty across the board, it's a First Amendment type issue. We don't have a First Amendment to so, so that we can talk about the weather. We have the First Amendment so we can say very controversial things. So for people to say that, uh, yes, we have our religious beliefs protected, but people who want to follow something else or a controversial religion, you can't do this. If you have the inconsistency, then you're really not defending liberty. But there are strict rules on freedom of choice of this sort, because you can't hurt other people, you can't defame other people. But yes, you have a right to do things that are very controversial. Controversial. If not, you're going to end up with government that's going to tell us what we can eat and drink and whatever. You know, it's amazing that we want freedom to pick the future, you know, our, 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 our future in a spiritual way, but not when it comes to our personal habits. But now, he's leading up to it. And, and, and again, let me explain. What Ron Paul is being demonized right now. He's uh, they, 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 their boats are being shifted. Every they, they're pulling everything out. They're calling him. They're doing the same thing to him that they tried to do to me with Charles Collins. Tried to call me a racist. I don't care what color you are. You know he's standing right beside a black man. Everything he says applies to the black man too. Now, but they are trying to even here. Ron Paul explains. This is put up by YouTube. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, Uploaded by uh, Vote Ron Paul, and you can go to uh, www.ronpaul.com. And uh, there, there, Ron Paul explains why it's okay to legalize heroin. That's part of the demonization. Even even if they're, you know, this is yeah, it got some headlines. Yeah, it got it, it grabbed its share. They've got six thousand viewers that ought to have more, and it will have because I'm putting it up on my website. And uh, what he is discussing now, and what he has said on the air about restoring the hemp, and restoring uh, restoring everything, 
and he's echoing now in his presidential debates right now, this is the most positive sign I've seen in 40 years, and I've been fighting this whole thing, this whole drug war bullshit, since it was a life sentence in Texas when I was growing up to smoke a joint. And there were men in prison that smoked a joint. But, but Sen Senator, are you suggesting that heroin and prostitution are an exercise of liberty? Well, you know, I probably never used those words. You put those words someplace, but uh, yes, in, in essence, if I leave it to the states, it's going to be up to the states. Up until this, this past century, you know, for over 100 years they were legal, what you're referring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put their hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. This is common sense. It's one of the things that I really, really noted when I was growing up in school. When I was growing up and still in school. The, uh, there were a few kids in school who scored slightly higher on the IQ test or on a, uh, on a few tests, and I knew them personally. And they remembered dates. I'm not real good at remembering dates. But they had no common sense. Ron Paul has common sense. Now, I've met these other politicians. I've shaken the hand of, of uh, uh, Pat Buchanan. Pat, congratulations, man. We really appreciate what you say when you when you say, hey, well, when I raise my right hand to take the oath of office for the presidency, the new world order comes crashing down. But, Pat, why aren't you talking about the Federal Reserve? Oh, I just don't know enough about it to talk intelligently about it. You've been in three administrations. You must know what the Federal Reserve is. You must know that it's a private bank. And uh, if not, one of your good friends, G. Edward Griffin, would be glad to inform you about it, since he wrote the uh, creature from Jekyll Island. Poor Pat, I was shaking his hand while I was doing this. And that's my throttle hand, so he couldn't get away. And I told, turned around and introduced him to Charles Collins, and said, "Well, Charles could probably tell you about that. He's a Rhodes Scholar, and a uh, and he's running for president too, wanting to abolish the uh, Federal Federal Reserve." <laughs> and Charles had his microphone unplugged in two states and every time Charles got up to speak all of the cameramen on stage turned the cameras off and pointed them at the ground we, we would go into a, a, a conference and put up the signs that said Collins for President we'd go in there the next morning and they'd all be gone Buchanan Stone would uh, still be there but the key signs would still be there but Charles Collins wouldn't and I had Pat on my show one last time. And I go, Pat, how could you do that show, Crossfire, for so long, so many years? And not get up and just slap the hell out of, uh... <laughs> slap the head out of, uh, uh, Bill Press. Well, Clay, I, I, I just... Ted Turner paid me a lot of money not to. And I said, oh, okay. Well, that answers...